You are listening to the Mark Guzman Podcast Experience. A true veteran of the art world, John Kleber and his wife Carol have brought their love of art to their community with their studio, Art Euphoria. Located in Martinez, California, Art Euphoria provides a space for all ages to get their creative juices flowing. There are even days when you can come in and paint your own pet. John is a Hollywood veteran, having worked in the art department of several productions and worked with companies such as Disney and Warner Brothers. Today, we talk to John about what it takes to operate an art studio for the public, as well as dive into the world of Hollywood artistry. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. Now, you have a studio called Art Euphoria, correct? Yes, I do. And that's okay out of Martinez. Yes, it is. So when did you start the studio? We started the studio. I'm in a partnership with my wife, Carol, and um, we started the studio back in 2012. I got uh, jury duty in Martinez, right? And I, had to go, I had to go there, and I, I actually got selected. So I spent a couple of weeks there on a case. And every day at lunch, I would go walk around and look at all the buildings. And I like really authentic old, you know, brick buildings like that because they're, they tend to be authentic in Martinez. They're not like, I live in Walnut Creek. I very rarely go downtown Walnut Creek, hardly ever. Walnut Creek has this feeling of, it was all created by Disney. They try to be old, but it was created, you know. Very commercialized. Yeah, it's been pushed. Yeah. It's been pushed. Whereas in Martinez, you find a building that's um, old, an old one of those old brick buildings there. They're old, man. They're really old. Well, many people don't know that. Martinez used to be the state capital for that's a little right. while. That is exactly right. It, it was. So I went there for jury duty, and I walked around. I saw all these beautiful buildings, and I thought, you know, this would be a great place to have a studio. And studios to me always were private studios where I would do my work. But I always like big places because I do um, in my spare time when I'm not creating graphics, you know, graphics and illustration, so on and so forth for commercial purposes. I would do fine art and I do big art. I like big paintings and um, I also like constructing things. I like making things out of wood. So... Um, it was perfect for me to have a big space. And um, so I looked, I was looking around, I saw these really wonderful big um, spaces. And at the, at, the, at the same time, I had a client that I was working with in Beijing, China, of all places, who was trying to get a um, television show off the ground and they wanted some production design done. And so she was an old friend of mine and so I decided to do it. And we were talking one day and she said, have you ever heard of a place called Art Jammin'? And I said, all right, Jammin, what's, what's that? She goes, darndest thing. She goes, people pay money to go into this place, sit down and paint, and they drink wine and stuff while they're doing it. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it does sound like a lot of fun. So I'm, just, I'm thinking, you know, that sounds like that kind of thing could work. And she said, it's packed all the time. They've done news stories on it here. It's a new phenomenon. There's bars that are cropping up where there's it's a regular bar in the front, but there's this room you can go into in the back, and there's people back there painting. It's an odd thing. That's a very cool concept. Though. Yes, it is a really cool concept. So I thought, you know, that would be great to try. And so having been right there in Martinez, I just decided, why not put it here? I didn't really didn't know a lot about the town other than it was kind of quaint. I, always, I pictured it kind of like a Mayberry kind of place where maybe somebody had a key to the jail and let themselves in and out when they were drunk and they could just <laughs> kind of go in there and sleep it off. It seemed like this really small place to me and real authentic with real genuine people. And so I thought, yeah, this is a good place to put this. This would be good. So the original business plan was to be nothing more than one of those paint places. The thing about it is, is that both my wife and I have extensive experience in graphic design and in for me it's illustration and then film production all kinds of stuff followed but um, being illustrators and working for a lot of the best people around and working with the best people around 
um, made us kind of fussy. And I didn't want to do just the regular old, you know, um, they come in, they paint a picture of a sunset with a, with a, a silhouette of a, of a palm tree in front of it. You know, I didn't, yeah. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something better. So we tried to emphasize the end result of the painting a little bit more than the socialization. We also didn't have a liquor license. So all we could do is have people bring their own liquor in. So we weren't really getting in on the money part of the business. I think the business plan is really where you almost give the painting away. But you sell them liquor all night. You sell them wine all night. You know, $9, 10 $11 a glass. Yeah, high profit margins. Absolutely. That's where the money was. So we didn't really understand that in the beginning. So we operated for almost four years under the premise that this would be, it'd be okay, that we would book so many parties that we wouldn't have to worry about. We'd do it volume. We'd do volume business. And we wouldn't have to worry about the booze. Well, it, it, it worked and it didn't work. Um, the place went for about four years and it finally started to break even. Just breaking even. And that wasn't with me taking any salary. That wasn't, you know, anything like that. But what happened in the process of that, too, was that the business expanded from just being a paint place in the evenings. I started taking in kids after school, do these after school programs, right, for, the, for, for kids. And um, it, uh, and people started using it. Now, it was weird because in order for me to compete, I had to compete against the Boys Club and Girls Club in Martinez, right in downtown Martinez, where most of the people sent their kids. Because for $24 a year, their kids could go there every day after school and play for like three hours. But can they paint there? Yeah, they can do all kinds of things. They can weave beads. They, can, they had pottery. They had all kinds of stuff. But it really, because so many kids take advantage of it, and it's a great thing. I don't want to... I don't want to say anything bad about the boys club and girls club because they're great. Um, but there's so many kids and a lot of the kids, they wouldn't be devoted to any of those activities because they also had pool tables, video games. They had stuff for the kids that are just going to be there for a couple of hours while their parents, you know, finish their work day and then come and get them. Yeah. So we wanted our kids to be more kids that were really interested in art and developing art and uh so we and, and the program was successful for three years we ran and we were successful and we we charged a hundred dollars a month you could come as much as you wanted for a hundred dollars a month it's from 2 30 to 5 30 every day they could be there for three hours every day and um it worked to a certain extent but still people were looking at that going no they can go to the boys club and girls club for 24 dollars a year why should i spend that extra money, you know? So we got a certain portion of the population, but we didn't get everybody like we thought we might. And it's, you know, so the, the business has been challenging and finding things that worked and things that didn't work. I had Saturday morning class, a uh, figure drawing class and a, and a basic drawing class. And that's been my big kind of thing so far. And that's where you're at now. Yeah, and the parties and the parties that we have we still do parties. We still do corporate parties where we do corporate um, team building exercises through art. Okay. We have a program that I developed called About Face that's for the veterans, and, it, and we teach them how to do a self-portrait so that hopefully they can kind of deal with whatever they've been through in the military and kind of bring it out, purge it, you know, put it on the canvas. And it's therapeutic for them. So we started a program like that. We, um, we have a carving class that meets on Thursday nights. Our carving, regular what wildlife carving class. Okay, so you're not just painting. Oh, no, 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 no. I've always, I, my background has provided me with the kind of thing where I love to try all kinds of mediums. I've always been one of these people that, that tried a lot of different mediums. It's what got me into the film industry in the first place. You know, I spent 35 years as an illustrator before I did any film at all. 
So let's talk about that because you also brought some pieces of work that you've done over the years. Well, I just I brought some stuff, some production design stuff, just to show you the you guys the kind of quality that that we we had. My 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 experience at Disney was really interesting. Um, when I got out of school, I wanted to go to work for Disney in the worst way. That's all I wanted to do. You know, they were they were the that was the thing I wanted to be. And so when I went to art school. I think that's still the thing today. Disney, Pixar, Disney, Works. Pixar, yeah. They well, you know, it's because they're such a huge um provider now for jobs. That's why a lot of people turn to Pixar, they turn to, to, to Disney because mm-hmm. they really do provide a lot of jobs. There's a lot of jobs that are for artists that are available in these in these in film production in particular. So uh but in those days, I just wanted to work for Disney. I just I looked at them and looked at what they did and said, this is the highest quality. There is no other high quality. You can say what you want about the the weird, schmaltzy kind of really heavy, syrupy kind of stuff that Disney was, you know, the kind of movies that they made. They felt like that, but there was one thing about them always. They were always beautiful. Really beautiful, really well, well done. Films. The best animators, the best stuff. Um, there is a current film right now that uh, Glenn Keane worked on that Kobe Bryant is involved with, and it's an animated film of Kobe Bryant kind of as a kid, as a little kid growing up. And uh, Glenn Keane was the guy that animated Tarzan for Disney. He is kind of the godfather of He's the big deal in animation. He, there's nobody better. This guy's amazing, and uh, just to see his and 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 be there, see his work, and to be am, among the artists that were there, it it gave me a different, a whole different take on what it was to be a Disney artist. You know, um, but along the way, they get you to drink the Kool-Aid, too. So you so how up, was it for you when you first entered uh, the process of working with Disney? It's really strange because I had spent a good, I think, 35 years on my own, in a studio, on my own, working as a freelance. I had 35 years worth of freelance work that was just, st- they were stacked up. The jobs were stacked up like little airplanes waiting to land. It was in the heyday of, of illustration. It was in one of the big il- illustration and photography. It's interesting. They ebb and flow. It's, everything's photography for a while, and then illustration will catch up, and there'll be a lot of illustration, and then it'll go like that. Well, what's happened now? The 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 computer changed all that because I was working when we did everything traditionally, um, and along and my career moved into when we had computers as well. But uh, when we did everything by hand you there was this sense of every piece was precious and all of a sudden along comes the computer and you can spit out 19 ways of doing one image 19 different possibilities within for doing minutes one image right within seconds just ding 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 just by changing colors and moving saturation points and changing the values and changing the lightness and the darkness, exposure times, all this stuff was all controllable. Do you miss the infinite. do you miss the I do hand handmade? Yeah, animation. I still draw. I still draw. Everything that I do now still starts out outside the computer. And I make sketches and I make drawings. And there are guys at Pixar that do the same thing, and my hat's off to those guys, the ones that are still holding on. And they want to do things traditionally because there's a certain uh, simplicity and a beauty to it. There's there's this weird, I don't know, it feels like the machine has been taken completely out of the process. Here I am working again with nothing more than a piece of paper and a pencil. Does it feel like your own creativity can come out 100% when you're doing hand-drawn? Yeah, because I know now, this is the interesting thing, the computer made this possible, because I know now everything that I draw, there aren't too many of them that I can't turn into something. used to be you'd draw something 10 times to get it right once. 
You know, because here, here's the thing about being an illustrator versus being a fine artist. Uh, an illustrator, you get a call from Time Magazine. They want you to paint a, a portrait of Obama for the cover of Time Magazine. He's going to be man of the year or whatever it is, whatever the assignment is. Mm -hmm. You get that assignment and you have to turn that thing in pretty much overnight. They don't. Really? They're notorious for not getting ahead, not booking you ahead. You know, they wait for the last minute and then they'll call you. And that, in my case, that might have just been because I was one of the, I was one of the also rants. Oh yeah, if we can't get this guy, we can get John. We can't okay. get this guy, we'll get John. And and that was when I was starting my career out. So they know? played like the supply and demand game. Yeah, they always did. And then the money was nothing. If you wanted to do the cover of Rolling Stone, you weren't going to get paid much for it. They give you a hundred bucks, maybe a couple hundred bucks, but everybody wanted the cover of Rolling Stone because it launched a lot of illustrators. Playboy magazine launched a hell of a lot of illustrators in the seventies and probably the sixties too. Um, it's, it's amazing um, what these magazines, the power they had, they don't have that power anymore because nobody reads magazines. Hardly yeah. Anymore. Everything's online now. Everything's online. I mean, you it's have changed. YouTubers and bloggers I yeah. mean, that have way more views than your average television well, show. Well, you know, and I'm, st I'm still, I'm a paper whore. Because I love paper. I just can't keep my hands off paper. Paper is great to me. So magazines are still something that I enjoy looking at and going through. And when I see one, I see a document, anything that's been printed really nice. You know, you it's it's impressive to me. But that's just because of the, the, the background and the fact that I'm older than dirt now and I've been around a long time. And I appreciate those things because that's the way we used to do everything. We did everything by hand. So what projects do you work on while with Disney? When I was with Disney, they actually hired me. It's an interesting story. They hired me to do this uh, freelance project with them. And they were putting together for a videotape, mind you. This was for video. It was beta tapes. They were making beta tapes. <laughs> and they were, gonna, they were going to... Um, gang up five different um, nursery rhymes. That not, they weren't nursery rhymes. They were stories like Little Red Riding Hood, Three Little Pigs, Jack and the Beanstalk. I can't remember the other one. There were, there were three or four of them that they were going to link together, and they were going to sell it because videotapes, anything that had the Disney name on it during the, 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 the baby booming thing, that happened. Those would sell like out, in right? The 80s, 90s would sell. They'd sell every single one of them. It just had to have the Disney name on it. It didn't matter if it was awful. It just <laughs> had to have the Disney name. So they would sell these things, and they'd sell a lot of them. And so they were going to – that's that's how our project came about. So I got a call from Disney, and they said, would you be interested? Is this guy Steve Moore turned out to be a really great guy and a good friend of mine. They, he says – you know, Steve said, uh, John, would you be willing to um, be an art director for us on this uh, project that we have? We're doing an, we're doing a short. And I said, ah, uh, no, nah, no, nah, I don't know anything about production design. I, I, I couldn't possibly do that for you. Never done it before in my life. It sounds complicated. And nah, you know, I'm just happy in my studio. I'm making art. I, I'm fine. No, 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 really. We looked at your portfolio and we want you to do exactly what you do in your portfolio. And then I said, Oh, guys, I said, that's, I said, my stuff is really edgy. And I said, It's kind of not, a lot, sometimes not politically correct. Sometimes it's a little, you know, sexually charged. I said, It's not, I'm not for you guys. I, I don't think so. He said, No, listen, would you try? He, said, he t finally he talked me into trying a sample. He said, Listen, I just need you to build a time machine. He says, build me a crazy looking time machine and send it to me. And I said, oh, all right, all right. So I designed this time machine thing and I sent it off in the, in the FedEx in those days where everything went FedEx. So I sent it to him FedEx and about two weeks went by and I didn't hear anything. Never called, never nothing. I never, never heard anything. I figured, well, there you go. You know, that's why I didn't want to, because I didn't want to waste your time. Well, I get a call back, and, and um, 
Steve says, so did you, uh, have you seen my package? And I said, never got a package. And he said, oh, he said, I sent a package the other day. I said, didn't get there yet. And he says, when your FedEx comes today, give me a call. So my FedEx comes and I open the thing up. I came, not comes, came. Uh, and I opened this thing up and it was, uh, it wasn't a beta tape. It was a three quarter inch tape. Like they use in ad agencies to watch commercials that gives you more quality than you get with a VHS or with a beta. Right? Okay. So the thing was like this thick and it was like that and it needed a special player so you could look at it. And I said, I can't even watch the thing. You didn't have the special player. No, I don't have the player, man. You know, I called Steve. I said, what the hell are you sending me a three quarter inch tape for? I can't do anything with this. I said, for Christ's sakes. I said, this is just massive. Where am I supposed to watch it? And he goes, don't you know anybody that's got a player? And I said, I can go to an, so I figured I called one of my buddies at the ad agency. I said, I got to come over. I got to watch this thing. I stuck it in and here's my, 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 my time machine, and it's moving across the screen. It's running, and it's moving across the screen, and it's smoking, and it's spitting stuff out, and it's doing all this, and the wings are flapping, and everything that I, 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 I designed it for is, is, is there, and it's all moving. So they built it. They built it, and, and they built it. No, they drew it. They animated it. In those days, everything was animated 2D. There was no 3D. You didn't stick it in a computer and make it turn it into an object. We designed it flat, and then we'd have to do turnarounds. So you'd design it from the front, from the side, from the back, so that a, a, a guy could actually animate the thing. Right? It was like a prop. Okay. So they'd have to treat it like a prop. It has to be animated. And, and so it was all done, and I did everything with Xerox, engravings, anything I could find, photos, and then I'd paint whatever wasn't there. I'd paint it, I'd paint it in my style, and it got this hybrid weirdness, and uh, they loved it. They really loved it. So then they really started to hound me. Please, please. And I'm still going, what, do you, what, what, what would I do? You know, I mean, I already gave you the time machine. What, 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 would I, what else would I do? And they said, we need an art director. And we need a production designer. I'm going, man, those are leadership roles. I, you know, I can't even lead myself to the bathroom sometimes. <laughs> I said, how am I gonna, how am I gonna fucking do this for you? I can't. And they said, well, they said you'll pick it up as we go along. You'll kind of pick it up. You know, Steve will work with you and he'll show you everything you got to do. He says, you got it's just little stuff. It's like you got to make a color script. And I said, a color script for a 15 minute movie? I said, oh my god. And they said, ah, you know, five, six hundred frames, it's not a big deal. You know, you, you, they're little, they're tiny little things, and they just show mood. So all you have to do is have colors down so that we can see what kind of colors to make the palettes for the clothes, for the characters, you know, okay. all the stuff. And I said, yeah, you know, I know, make it look right, make it look good. And so bottom line was, oh, I, all right, all right, I couldn't stand the hounding anymore. I just said, okay, I'll do it. You know, and it was the greatest thing, and I loved it. I worked, and they let me work in my own studio. I didn't have to go to Hollywood. I just sit there all day long and knock out color, different colorways of of handling this this storyboard script that they where, sent me. Where was your studio at that time? Phoenix. I was in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. I had shared a studio space with a painter named Ed Mel, who came, went on to be a very very good painter. Um, He's got had a lot of museum shows now. He's he's a good guy. He's a little bit older than me. He and I have been, been good friends. But anyway, I was in his studio, so I, I was in Phoenix, and they never sent anybody over. Uh, they didn't call very often. Uh, I'd talk to Steve, and Steve would say things like, um, hey, buddy, it looks great, you know, keep it up. And it they didn't turn down anything that I sent them. And... <laughs> The, and they used everything? They used everything. They used it all. And what it was was not only were they paintings that were I they were they had to be environments because they had to be little stages where the characters would play out action, right? And so what we do is we do a hero frame for each one of this the sequences. You'd do a hero frame. 
like the interior of the the wolf's house, the interior exterior of the wolf's house, the interior of the garage where he worked. You know, it was like that. And the cool thing about it was they got big name actors involved in it because it was Disney. So we're working with Mia Farrow. We're working with um, Garrison Keillor. We're working a lot of people, a lot of the guys that are on the uh, on the outs list now. <laughs> um, Garrison Keillor. We were Adam West, the original Batman. Wow. Um, we had Don Rickles. My stepson's a huge fan of Adam West. Oh yeah, Adam West is Adam West was a big deal. Getting him was a big deal, and we had uh, we had Don Rickles, we had Kramer from Seinfeld, uh, Michael Richards. We had Michael Richards in it too, and uh, basically the you know the story was um, the wolf could not move on from the fact that he never ate Little Red Riding Hood. It never worked out for him. So he had to, he had to go, he wanted to go back and do it again. So he built his time machine in his garage and it takes him back in time to where it happened. And he tries a new tactic. He tries something new. And each time it doesn't work, he gets zapped in the time machine back to the, back to his house. But every time he comes back, he brings himself back as the new wolf, right? Because he tried something different. So he comes back as this, and they start to multiply because he makes these trips often. He keeps trying, and it, every, it fails every time. And it fails for more ridiculous reasons than, than you can imagine. You know, it, it was kind of like, um, it had the ridiculousness of Ren and Stimpy. It had the, it, it was just absurd. It was absurd stuff. And the references were absurd. Granny came out of the closet one time in a Panzer tank, <laughs> you know, like shooting everything up. Um, it was it was a wild ride. It was a wild ride, and it led me. What was interesting was working for Disney on that project. Um, I had flirted around with that kind of stuff before because I'd gotten some illustration jobs, where. And one of them was with the Pee Wee's, Pee Wee's Playhouse people. That came before Disney. But that was only a real brief thing. I mean, I spent a few days out in California with a studio called Colossal Pictures, which later became a place called Wild Brain. And these guys were, they made crazy stuff. They made stuff that no one had ever seen before. And that was for Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yes, and they were doing things for Pee Wee's Playhouse. They were doing things for every... And the, the guy that was there at Colossal Pictures was one of the guys that was responsible for animating um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So they had some big people that were working there at that studio. And they loved this kind of half-painted, half-Xeroxed, look that I was working on. So they hired me to do a Pizza Hut commercial for them that Pee Wee's Playhouse was going to own. And it would only run when Pee Wee's Playhouse was on because it directly related to the Pee Wee's Playhouse look, right? And uh, so I met a bunch of people through that that kind of helped advance um, my career into different aspects of film. It wasn't too long after working with animation that I wanted to actually do live action and stuff. Live action seemed much more appealing. Yeah. And you could write stories that, and I was learning to become a story writer. That was the one thing I really, really learned at Disney was um, storytelling, visual storytelling, how to make people feel for Little cartoon well, I characters. think that's one of the things that Disney really excels at. I mean, yeah. if you look at everything that they've done, even with um, Marvel, yes. the Marvel and now the Star Wars franchise, Absolutely. the one thing that they excel at is storytelling. Story. They don't fool around with story. Story, the thing has to be really good. They used to tell us um, if the story's good in an animated film, it can, you, can do, you can use stick people to play it out. Yeah. And people will, will love it. Yeah, and I guess the um, the new Han Solo movie coming out, they had to get rid of the directors. They brought in Ron Howard. Yeah. They, 
I mean, they completely had to start from scratch again yeah. just because, you know, it has to be their story a certain way and it they does. just excel at it. It does. So you probably want to know how all of this relates to our euphoria. Yes. Okay. Um, I told you I have a tendency to steer off, so you just got to steer me back when I get steered off. Um, yeah, I, I never really wanted to move to Los Angeles. If I was going to pursue a career with the film industry for very long, you kind of got to be down there. Um, I went down there to work for Warner Brothers, and I had to take an apartment down there. My family was up here. I have two kids and, and my wife, and my daughter was is a very gifted um basketball player and so she had basketball almost year round. she played aau basketball and stuff she had almost year round. Uh, we we had basketball so they didn't want to move down to la and i understood why we had a nice house over in walnut creek i didn't want to leave that and so i took the, this uh i took this job with the idea that it would be about eight months and it was um a looney tunes piece called looney tunes back in action and what it was was they were taking cartoon characters that they had hand animated and hand drawn, and they had a lighting system that this guy, um, Scott Johnston, had developed. And it was called Luma, Luma Light. I think it was called Luma Light. And um, it would put cast shadows onto characters. And it was the first time that anyone had figured out an easy way to do it. And it was kind of combining. It gave you a look that was sort of two and a half D. We used to call it two and a half D because okay. it wasn't quite quite three D, but it was better than two D. And this wasn't through computers yet. Yeah, no, this was through computers. He de he de he developed this whole thing. He was one of the guys that helped develop Deep Canvas, okay, which was a um, uh, pro product that they used on uh, Tarzan to animate the for the first time. The backgrounds were all animated. Leaves were moving and stuff where it was happening that was deep canvas so he was he was a pretty smart fellow and he developed this luma light thing and we ran it on these characters and my responsibility for the project was as the animation art director so i oversaw all of the backgrounds that were made for the characters and i oversaw all of the um, um color palettes uh, I used to go in. This was my my big claim to fame was I could sit in a screening room and be there, be in there with a 70, 70 millimeter screen, you know, up on there. This is a huge screen. And I could point out if there was a pixel that was out of place on the thing, I could find it. I just have an ability. You just I, had that eye. Yeah, for I don't even know how I don't even know how I got it. You know, I I also have the ability, like if somebody shows me something and there's supposed to be something dead center in the middle of the frame. I can tell you if it's one or two pixels off one side or the other. That's how, and I suppose that's just developed over time. You, you, you know, when you're drawing things and they have to be accurate, you're measuring things all the time. You're measuring the length of feathers, you know, versus how big the duck's head is, how big this is, how big that is, where you can kind of... So you did that often. So that's very common then measuring to make sure proportions are yeah, correct. Yeah, proportions are correct. And I think that had something to do with me being able to spot things that were off. So it was a perfect job for me. You know, I, I would, uh, I really would, 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 would look over everything. And there were a lot of other people in the room as well. This is the big thing that you learn when you work on a film. You can't take credit for that film because that film is a collaborative effort and everybody that works on a film like that, down to the down to the guy that's delivering the stuff from room to room so that it gets there on time, everybody is responsible for that piece. And if one of those things breaks down, the whole production It's probably one of the biggest to, 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 you know, chug down. It's probably one of the biggest team collaboration projects it around. Is. Building the movie, it is. It absolutely is. So when I was down in in Los Angeles, I just I spent what was supposed to be nine months or eight months turned into like sixteen months. It was a longer process than we thought. So, with your experience at Disney, Warner's, yes, how how are you incorporating all this into Art Euphoria? Yeah. 
Well, so that was the thing. In in it was a natural for me to try to teach people or guide people through how to paint because that was one of my big duties when I was at Disney and at Warner's. You're in charge of other artists and you're trying to get them to paint a certain way. In 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 the in the case of Disney, they were it was the last movie um, Return to Neverland was one of the last movies that they used traditional painted backgrounds on. And it was because we were trying to imitate the backgrounds that were done for for the uh, 50s version of Peter Pan, the original. So, you know, learning and teaching guys how to paint, I figured to myself, what's the difference between teaching those guys? I mean, they already know how to paint, but you still have to push them on to making strokes a certain way and doing changing their you know, changing their style. You're asking these guys to change their style. I would imagine that'd be really tough with creative people that are talented because yeah, you they have don't to tell paint them. that way. And some yeah, of them didn't yeah. like it. You know, some would go like, eh, I don't like that. I don't want to paint it that way. That's a stupid looking leaf. I don't want to paint that. And you'd have to get them to settle down. It's cool and do it and show them methods where they would get very successful at it. And once they learned how to do what it was we were asking them to do, most of them kind of came around, started to appreciate it too, and started to like it. You know, it's sort of, I guess maybe that's when you're forced, you, you know, your back's up against the wall, yeah. you got to do it, you got to do it. And um, so I did, I figured, what's the difference between that and teaching people who don't know how to paint, guiding them through a painting when there's, when the drawing is already on the canvas, all they have to do is paint it in. And we made sure that the stuff that we worked with, the imagery that we worked with, we tried to up the ante on the imagery. Because I just, I, you know, I, I've won awards before. We were nominated for an Oscar. I wanted, I, w I had a fussy, I was fussy about what I was wanted to come out of there. I wanted the stuff to look good. I didn't want it to be a bunch of just stuff that wasn't even going to make it past your, your garage. You know, once you got home, you were going to stick it in the garage or worse, put it right in the basket, you know, and forget yeah. about it. I wanted people to be able to go home with something that they wanted. So we started thinking about things like, what if we have workshops where we do paint your pet or we show them how to do a self-portrait? And what they would do is send us the portraits ahead of time. We would take and get them transferred onto the canvas, which meant hand tracing in our case. We would hand do the hand Okay, so so when image. they show up, it's already hand traced. It's already hand traced onto the onto the canvas and pencil, and not simply done either. It's done so that we try to teach them some skills, try to get them to 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 understand some things. You know, I'm always talking about what different brushes will do. Uh, we used to do brush clinics. We eliminated them after a while, but we started out, we'd show people how to use the brush. We'd say, flat brush does this. And we'd give them test sheets to work on. And they could just sit there and make whatever they wanted with it. Because the whole idea was to was to 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 show and involve the community in, in the arts. And it's one of the things, you know, we would have loved to have put the place in Walnut Creek couldn't afford it. Walnut Creek would have been six times the rent that we want that we were going with in Martinez. It would have been six times. Well, Martinez is now booming and it's a great central location. It's not booming. It's starting to boom now. Things are changing there, leaps and bounds. Oh man, if you look down Main Street, what used to be a lot of antique stores are now little bistros and places where you can get a drink and places where you can get a you know a slice of pizza new york style pizza you know there's a little greek restaurant that's cropping up there and states coffee brought a lot of folks in states coffee has a regular crowd that comes from oakland just to sit there and drink their coffee outside states wow, coffee. all the way from oakland yeah wow yeah it's a really interesting thing so there's there's a lot starting to go on there. Um, it's been a long time. Like, we've been there for five years. We were one of the first businesses where we were trying something that was, that we knew was a little on the hipster side 
and and they really hadn't started coming around yet. So, you, you know, Martinez is a working community, you know, and Walnut Creek, on the other hand, is more of a white collar community. There would have been a, when you're selling art services, they're not the same and they're never going to be the same. And I don't want to, I don't want to stereotype anybody or say that this is, but there is a difference in those two communities. But I wanted to put it somewhere where it would actually do some good. Mm -hmm. And we thought Martinez could use this, you know, this so, would be good for it. And what it did was it started to bring out all these other, all the other business kind of went, well, they've been here for three years and they're not done yet. Well, maybe we can, maybe we can do something with that. And they started finding out that there's, it's a very charming place. So you have paint your pet. Yeah. You do uh, birthday parties for kids. We do birthday parties for kids. And uh, what other programs and events do you hold there too? Well, we'll do, you we actually do you adult mentioned parties. Uh, adult parties, and you yes. also mentioned um, uh, corporate team building events. Corporate team building events where um, we, well, I'll just I'll give you an example. We did one for the dental department over at DVC. They came over. And we designed a tree. And what I did was I took that tree and I broke it down into, into however many canvases. And I think there were 20 people involved in the thing. So we worked it out where we had 20 people involved. Each one of them got a canvas. And we gave them colors. And they did the painting, right? They put the colors in place. And it and became one giant painting. What they didn't understand when they first started the project was that they were going to be part of a big thing that was all going to be put together. And when they found out, they realized that they kind of had to work together to do that. That's you very know, neat. You're checking the colors and making sure that the guy that you're going to butt up next to, that you've, you've hit it. You know, Because even though we put the lines in, is there's no guarantee that the paint's going where it's supposed to go. Yeah. Not always. <laughs> yeah. I did something similar with the, I'm on the board of realtors for Contra Costa Association, and mm -hmm. every year we have to do some team building event. And so we went to uh, San Francisco, and I forgot the name of the place, but it was uh, glass blowing. And part of it was creating this uh, giant glass logo, and we just rebranded our new logo. So we had to create the new logo in glass. So and we each had a piece, uh -huh. and it's hilarious how it came out. But it was a fun experience. Was it the Crucible? No. Um, oh, the Crucible's in Oakland, actually. Okay. Yeah. No, we were in San Francisco. Um, I'd have to pull up. The, I'd have to pull up the name. I've got it in my email somewhere. So, how do you come up with the name Art Euphoria? <laughs> What's the history behind that? Um. Well, my wife and I. My wife was uh, Carol. Was a. Um, creative director for a long time ad agency design studio and she's a graphic designer as well and so the two of us when it came to marketing for art euphoria and coming up with the name and doing all that stuff we just applied the the rules that we learned when we were in advertising about how to brainstorm a project like that and uh we were looking for something that we could use where we could, we, we wanted to, I hate to use the license plate thing as a, as an example, but we were looking for something that we could spell out like that, right? That we could kind of do something clever with the spelling. Okay. So, um, and in hindsight, I will tell you this, I, th I think this is good advice. This is only my opinion, by the way, I would never say that it's anything but an opinion, but my, my belief is that Art Euphoria, the name, as you read it, is difficult to get the first time. Most people go, Art 24 ia <laughs> no, Art 24 ia It's just like you and I when we sit in a car and the guy in front of us has got a vanity plate on there. And you're going, Buster, Fuzzy, was what? You know, and you don't yeah. know what it is, and you're starting to figure it out, and you keep running it over and over and over again different ways. But once it, it clicks, takes, it's memorable. Once it clicks, it's memorable. But the problem was 
a lot of people just, I think they got frustrated with it because they, it, it, they, they knew it was, there was no branding there. This guy would come in and say it this way. This woman would come in and say it this way. This person would come in and say it this way, that way. And you know, when that's happening, you don't have branding. There's no solid branding. There was no art euphoria. People didn't understand it was art euphoria. And once you told them, they went, oh, we could have spelled it differently that would have made it probably clearer, but I didn't like those combinations of letters. We were looking at stuff where art euphoria was going to be E E A, you know, at yeah. the end, and you're looking at it and you're going, it doesn't look good. It does it doesn't it doesn't work, you know. So we tried to spell it out and in hindsight we could have probably done a better job with that. But once you roll it out and it's in there, then you can all you can do is try to drive it home. Yeah. You know, make sure that it works. So, so. what's your website if people are interested in getting some more information? Website is um ArtEuphoria.com. Okay. And we'll go ahead and link that up. Now, you brought in some work here. I did. So, so let's uh, take a look at it. And Okay. And I know for listeners, they're not going to be able to visually see it here on the podcast, but we will have photos available on all the social channels. And, um, of course, we'll link up the website. That's great. Um, one of the things I wanted to tell you before, we, you know, Carol could not be here today. And, and largely she couldn't be here because she, if you put a microphone in front of her and you ask her, say, good morning, she goes, <laughs> and, and she can't do it. So that's why she's not here. But what I wanted to tell you about her was that she went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. She um, was an apprentice to an artist um, named... Edmonds, his last name was Edmonds, and he was a realist, an American realist that was very good, and he actually, um, uh, he died in, back in December, he died just recently, but he did egg tempera, he taught the old art of egg tempera. Now what is that? Egg tempera is where they mix eggs with powdered color. And they, they whip it up. And, you know, if you, you probably know, like, if you throw an egg at somebody's car, you're going to destroy the paint because the egg just adheres to it. And it will never let go. Right. And when it does let go, it pulls some luster out mm -hmm. of the color. Right. And it's, you're done. So egg tempera works in, in as a binder. The egg is the binder, I think, that binds the pigment to the canvas. But it's a real, real old way of, of working with, uh, with with paint very interesting it, yeah it was really cool and so she apprenticed for that guy and she um modeled for a couple of the paintings uh that he did um and so uh and and then from there she went to um, virginia beach and um, got a job in an ad agency in virginia beach and it led her out to um phoenix arizona where i met her and we met at this ad agency, and we were buddies for 17 years. And then circumstances kind of led themselves where we got together one time, and we got married. So I've known her my whole adult life. I mean, 40, 42 years. Wow. I've known her for 42 years, married to her for 25, but knew her for 42. Wow, congratulations. It's a long time. It's a long time to be. I, I I know everything about her, and I know you know she's she's a great person. Anyway, um, she's a very good painter in her own right. She's a realist. I think he taught her pretty well because uh, she's very good. And we have we have some examples of her work at Art Euphoria that people can see. She she's pretty shy about pulling her work out too. So she's not one of these. She doesn't want the headlines. You know, she leaves the headlines. To me, I, I, I handle them better. I am comfortable when you point a camera at me. I'm pretty comfortable when I get a microphone in front of me. I don't freeze up. I, I mean, I knew what I was going to talk about when I came here today, and it wasn't. it's not too difficult. But anyway, so that's, that's a little bit about Carol. And she uh, was sorry she couldn't be here today. There's no disrespect intended. She just, oh, I don't know. That freaks me out. <laughs> um, 
So I'm just going to show you a few things here. You, you can, well, actually, you guys can go through this as, uh, as much as you want. Um, but these were the kinds of things, these were the paintings that we would do um, to show director, a director, um, what we were thinking about as far as a scene is concerned. Now, all this is hand-drawn. This is all hand-painted, and what we did was, once we would finish the painting, we'd do nothing more than finish the painting and then scan it into the computer, not do anything with it except spit out digital printouts. Wow. That's all it was for. So for listeners, I'm looking at a skull rock that is yes. slightly deformed, and it looks like a pirate ship that's crashed. Yes. This looks like something that would be out of the Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, what this was was this was our design for Skull Rock, which was in Peter Pan. Okay. So most most of the stuff I think that we're that, that you're gonna see right here right now is all associated with that film. Um, but this this just shows you the kind of quality that that these folks were were into. I mean they would show um, we can move these wherever wow. you want for picture taking purposes so you don't have to like you know get in between things I'll that's amazing away from it yeah so and and what I mean, what, just the details what peter pan the second peter and these these were considered just sketches these were not full blown paintings these were just sketches these were sketches that quickly defined the thing that we were were trying to define like you'd be surprised how simple this is put together this area right here just like that and like that that's one swipe two or two swipes of paint up and down to get that down there and then the next thing you work with is just black and you're working with black defining where the where the holes in the building are where the doors were where the windows were it's very simply put together when you look at it. it's all layers and you, we would work with a with a, a hair dryer in one hand and a brush in the other hand. So you'd be painting and you'd be hitting it with a hair dryer real fast so it would dry. So you could continue putting things over the top of it because, you know, man, these guys are under deadline and you had to move fast. Wow. There was no messing around. I w when I got there to Disney, I was told I needed to do 40 paintings a day. Like this. Forty paintings meant no, they weren't like this. Which was, and we'll get to it later as we go as we go through this, because there's there's a um, there's a picture in here of some of the stuff. But so for know. the listeners, you have to go. We're going to post some of these photos on my Facebook page. Yeah. You have to go check it out. The tent. I mean, the detail on these photos is amazing. And you're saying it's extremely simple. Once you start, once you understand the process of how they're put together, and you realize that a silhouette like this silhouette, this this thing is all made up of silhouettes, and we're just painting paints over the tops of those silhouettes to get the detail. I have to take a picture of this on my phone too. This is amazing. And this, these are these paintings here are about like this. They're about like that, that big, and they're like that. So they are what we would call final development paintings. Yeah, this is amazing. I mean, so, for listeners, you have to go to Facebook. We'll have it there. And, you know, it's not that, it's not that they're incredible paintings. What it, more what it is is how they show off the lighting and how they show off the local color of what's in the room or what's in the location that we're, that we're doing. You know, that they, definitely looks like Peter Pan. Yeah, they we we studied it for we studied it for months before we took any of this stuff. Um, and I'm gonna, now I'm, now is I'm going to ask you a question. Is there yeah. is there a universe like they do with the Marvel universe, DC universe, Star Wars universe? Is there does Disney have like a Peter Pan in the universe where all the cartoons connect to each other? No, <laughs> no. No, Peter Pan is our characters onto Peter Pan. You won't see them cross over into any other, into any other. And they're 
as a, it's, it's funny that you mention that because Disney at Disney has a character police that they go around and they look to see how those characters are being used. If one of the studios is making a project, any kind of project, even if it was like a 10 minute cartoon or something and say they were going to use Mickey, Minnie, Goofy and uh, Tinkerbell, they were going to have them perform in a cartoon together. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they would come in and they would make sure that each one of those characters was being treated like that character is supposed to be treated. Like there are certain wow. things that those characters will do. There's certain things they won't do. And recently, one of the things that happened with, with Disney was in the early days of those characters, like Pluto, he bit people. Man, Pluto chased people out of the yard. He bit them, whatever it was. All of that had to be removed. They made them, they made the character, the people that designed the characters, they made they made them remove those things from the characteristics of those characters, which was really weird for, for some of us. You know, they took, and they had, uh, it was really cool. Uh, one really good example of, of, of um, something that Disney did is they had a, uh, they had Pecos Bill, was a folk American folk hero, right? He's the one that supposedly carved the Rio Grande, and right, it's yeah. this, it's it's he's sort of like uh, John Henry, the guy with the hammer that that built the railroad, right? It's it's that kind of deal. So uh, they they did this great cartoon of Pecos Bill, and he would sit on his horse, but it came to this point where he pulls out a cigarette paper, and he opened he well, he's got this hand. And he opens the bag and the tobacco goes, whoosh, it sails right out over there and it just lays down perfectly inside the cigarette. And then he sticks it in his mouth and he puts it all the way in his mouth. And a couple seconds later, he just goes, whoosh, and it comes out. It's already lit. I've seen a bunch of other cartoon characters. I've seen uh, Tom from Tom and Jerry do that. Exactly. <laughs> it's the same kind of thing. They made him take all that out. They had to remove every, everything that was no longer politically correct. So the basic personalities of those old characters all had to change. Like they turned Goofy into like a buffoon kind of thing, man, where he's sort of, oh, just stupid and lame. And that wasn't what he was when he was in the early days. Different he, times back yeah, then. Yeah, he was clumsy. He always was clumsy, but he never was a, a dummy, you know? And they, and it's it was just really weird what they did to him. and. It was all in, 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 in regards to political correctness, what they could now get the characters, allow the characters to do. Interesting. But Roy Disney, um, which was Walt's nephew, he used to come around and do all the character policing. And on our show in particular, the because we made our movie up in Toronto, we didn't have to be inside the studio system, which was great. We had the satellite office up in Toronto and they left us alone. Very rarely did we see the executives come in that, you know, we were kind of on our own. And it led us to some pretty cool things. We had music done by a group called They Might Be Giants, which were really interesting guys once upon a time. I don't know if they're even making music anymore, but they were kind of cool. Um, we were able to use people like Tom Waits. We were able to do some cool stuff. Amazing but, stuff. Yeah, Amazing. But these days, it's, you know, it's a little different. So anyway, this stuff is all, I was going to show you these little drawings. You know, I had mentioned that we had to do paintings, um, small stuff. So I'll show you one of these sequences that we, we had to do. Um, I told you guys I talk a lot. And I, I have a lot of stuff <laughs> to show. I warned you. Don't, don't say that I, I didn't warn you. But we do something like this. And that okay, was a this particular is what, sequence. This is what you were talking about earlier, then. Yeah. This, was, this would be a particular sequence on a film. We'd take the storyboards, and we'd paint the storyboards up so that they look like this. So the guys, this is a very collaborative effort as well. The guys that, the guys that worked on this, yes, I painted them, but somebody sat there and figured them all out. Someone from the layout department, so are these the color boards that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, where, where we would start. This is like a color script. Okay. We would do 
all these sequences so that we would get and you're putting them together once you put one of these color scripts scripts together in a long strip you should be able to see the high moments of the film where everybody's happy and the real low moments of the film because the low moments are these dark they're all dark and the high moments are all bright and cheery and it's cool and the dark moments are all dark so you're you're looking for this ebb and flow through the script that you want to that you want to I don't think up. I'm ever going to be able to see another animated film the same way. I'm going to be looking for all these different well, clues. Yeah, and that would be this would be an example of just a character sketch. Okay, the girl and her dog and they're running. It was set during in London during the Blitz. So these little things. I had to make these little things up. And these little things they wanted they wanted them so fast that we learned to paint those characters with just just a few strokes you know you can you can tell that there's not a lot that's going into that you know they made us work with pretty big brushes they they used to tell us they'd say get into your kit and get the biggest brush you can find and make the smallest mark you can make with it and what it does is it gives you really good control over a larger brush where you can do all kinds of things so i didn't have to change brushes or put brushes down I'd paint my background in, and then I could go in here and my brush, I could get my brush to do that, and I could also get the same brush that made that fatty stroke there, make that skinny stroke right there. And, and it, for the listeners, we're looking at four small paintings, and this is obviously uh, Peter Pan. Right. These are, this, this, again, is color script stuff to show what the palette is going to look like, because each time you put the character in a new surrounding, the flesh color has to change, the colors on his clothes change, depending upon how much light is on the character. Amazing. So, and we used to pool light in all of our, all of our uh, backgrounds. We'd pool the light somewhere, and that was usually where the characters were gonna stand and where they were gonna do their thing. So it's, it's, all, it's all a very, you know, it's an interesting process the way the way it goes. And the funny thing is this, you know, looking at this, you guys are welcome to look at this if you want to. Um, the funny thing about this is this is where I came from. This is where when they found me, when Disney found me, this is what I was showing them. Wow. This is what they looked at and went, oh, yeah. And I couldn't figure it out. I thought, why in the world would you want to mess with me? I am not what you would consider to be anything close to what a Disney guy would do, you know? But I, was, I, I could, I, I personally can see why, though, because... Yeah, the char there's the, characters involved, and they do have kind of a, a, a friendly spirit. Yeah. But as you'll see... As we go along here, they get, they're not all, you know, I, and I would also work 3D with these guys, too. I'd build environments like this and then put some kind of character in the environment just to see what the camera would see if they were looking at, you know. Because we used to have to figure out a lot of camera angles, too. You're figuring out how to show something the best way. If you've got two figures in it or you got one, whatever it is that's in there. Um, I wanted to get to... Some of the, see, this is the stuff that we were using for the short that I did for um, for Disney was, it was stuff like this. See, I'd create, I'd find wow. junk and put junk together and then paint parts of it. You know, and so this is really the stuff that put me on the map. You know, I got lucky and I got an article. They wrote an article about me in Graphis magazine, which was a big deal to get in those days. And it was a 15-page spread. It had a bunch of my work in it, and it changed my life. Because I got that, and that was printed in five different languages, so it went all over the world. I like the martini glass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This one kind of yeah. reminds me of like the kind of art style from uh, the Yellow Submarine. Yeah, yeah a little like, bit. So it's, kinda... it's it's odd stuff. <laughs> it is very odd stuff. 
It's yeah, very the awesome. attention again. The details is just amazing. And the colors, yeah. And when I paint, I usually do. I'll usually do this when I get ready to work out a painting, a large scale painting. If I'm going to do a large scale painting, I'll do a couple of studies that are like this, and they're small studies, and they just have a certain look to them that is awesome this was uh, this this was a really unusual thing this was a painting that was um to be sent down to the people at um duck dynasty when duck dynasty was on the air so, <laughs> that's yeah. why the duck has a beard yeah that's why the duck has a beard and i took a lot of time to do the painting the painting is i don't know six feet one way and four feet the other way and uh the painting got finished, almost finished. It was it was really close to being finished. And one day I was in the studio and I was doing some photography and I needed, this is what happens around my place. I needed something to block the light from coming in. And that was handy. It was sitting right there. So I just grabbed it and I brought it over here and I put it on an easel. And I set it up so that it blocked the light. I got the shot that I needed and I left it sitting there thinking it's fine. My friend comes walking in. He knocks into the canvas, and he drives a chair right through it. Oh, my God. It's like a chair just went, boom, and it punctured it, like a puncture, yay long, and an L-shaped puncture like that, right? And so I can't send that to a client. I, I can't. That's not right. So I had to... Um, I ended up keeping the painting hanging around there, and it was there for the longest time, and I finally... One day was watching a program where somebody was repairing a canvas and they were using Bondo. And I said, Bondo, what a great idea. Bondo will work perfectly. And so I Bondoed it back together and just repainted the spot where the, where the error was. And if you didn't know it was there, you'd never know it was there. But you turn the painting around from the back and there's this huge rip and a big hunk of Bondo that's in, you know, wow. where it is. So it was no good to anybody but me. So I still have the painting. That's amazing. But, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I do now. I do that, and I, I do a lot of black and white work. That's another story for a different blo uh, different uh, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's so that's how we kind of got to be Art Euphoria, and my idea was to put I wanted to, I wanted to put something back in the community anyway. I, I, I made a lot and did a lot of things during my time. It, you know, in my career afforded me certain um, luxuries and things that I wouldn't have had. I got to travel. I, you know, I, I got to meet people and I got to travel. It was fun. And so I wanted to put something back and I thought, you know, kids, I like kids and I, and, you know, I, having shepherded a daughter through AAU basketball and co you know, coaching her and helping her and doing it, it was a natural to try to do this, for, for, for children and adults alike. I just thought, you know, if I can pass on some skills to somebody, the schools aren't going to pass these skills on anymore because they don't do it this way anymore. So, you know, and I think we probably could have done a lot better or, or would do a lot better if, if we were to open it up to computer-driven arts as well. You know, but that costs a lot of money to get involved in that. Yeah, I bet. You have to have a certain amount of computers on hand. Everybody's got to have a computer to work on so that when you're doing something up here on the board, they can follow. Yeah. You know, you have to have it. And you can ask people nowadays, bring your own pad in or bring your own computer in that you can work on. I suppose you could do that. But we'd like to provide the service, you yeah. know, and have it be right. Well, I, I think you have an amazing thing going on. Your art here is absolutely amazing thank you i'm for sure going to be signing up for some classes because i mean that's ama that's amazing if i can get just a little sliver of that talent I'll, i will be so impressed yeah, you never know so john thank you for being on the podcast hey thank I you mean, guys for having is, me i appreciate it thank you so much for listening to the podcast thank you to our producer sam lemon please subscribe like comment and share the podcast Remember, you can listen to the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, iHeartRadio, 
Google Play, SoundCloud, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. For more information on my business as a property manager and real estate team, go visit my website at markguzman.com. I really, really want to thank all of you for listening. It means the world to me, and I hope today's episode provides you value in your day-to-day life. I created this podcast to help showcase the many great people that live in this world and help share some knowledge that I've learned along the way in life. Again, thank you for listening. Check out our sponsors, and I'll catch you on the next episode.